Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and your family are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment. And we look forward to welcoming you back to our Yacht Club as soon as conditions permit. In the meantime, we're taking advantage of um, this global Zoom technology to bring guest speakers from around the world to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Such is the case today. Our speaker um, was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and is told by her, by her parents that at age one, she was uh, riding around in the family canoe uh, in the Mill River in Connecticut. And by age six, she remembers uh, attending science camp, Schooner Inc. Uh, Marine Science Camp. And by age 13, one of the milestones in her life was she got to be a camp counselor at Schooner Marine Science Camp. Uh, by 18, she joined the Coast Guard and attended the Coast Guard Academy at New London, Connecticut. Uh, age 19, a milestone for her was interdicting, get this, a Russian trawler, a 400-foot Russian trawler on the border between the United States and Russia. Uh, this is a big dragnet trawler, which was illegally fishing, targeting Pollock. Um, in the Bering Sea, and there she was as a rising sophomore uh, Coast Guard cadet, um, you know, basically taking this pirate off the shore and, uh, you know, stopping them from this illegal fishing. Um, by age 23, uh, she was an ensign, and she helped commission a 220-foot uh, finished brand new Coast Guard cutter in Marionette, Wisconsin. And she would sail eastward out the St. Lawrence Seaway, down the eastern seaboard of the United States, across the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, and uh, bring it off down to the South Pacific in Guam. Such are the activities of a 24-year-old, um, you know, ensign in the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, she remembers in eight, by age 24 being stationed off of Cordova, Alaska. And again, in a 225-foot cutter and conducting her first boarding of a 100-foot fishing vessel that was, in fact, top-notch, had all her documentation binderized and was completely compliant and impressive in their fishing efficiency and their compliance with regulations that would keep them fishing for, you know, years and decades to come. By 2017, she got what she has defined as her dream job. She became the Marine Program Coordinator of Wild Care, a 501c3, which is helping marine protected areas improve their efficiency globally. And so with an annual budget of 10 million bucks and a staff of about 60 folks, she is um, basically doing everything she can to protect our marine protected areas and improve their efficiency. And so to tell us all about marine protected areas and what wild care is doing to improve their efficiency, our speaker today, Megan Brosnan, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. We're gonna to wanna to learn all about marine protected areas. And so please tell us uh, how you're able to save the planet by fulfilling the promise of marine protected areas. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me, Ron. I appreciate it. There has been an upswell globally in desires to increase the protections for the oceans, usually in the form of marine protected areas or MPAs. Unfortunately, 60% of the world's MPAs are nothing more than lines on a map. There is no real enforcement, no real implementation associated with that. Without those protections, you might as well have just put a target on some of the most pristine places in the world and told the poachers where to go. So the good news is that the program that I oversee, Wild AIDS Marine Program, has been for 20 years working in partnership with the rangers in these locations to build these enforcement protections. And our blueprint for MPA success can be replicated and help solve this problem worldwide. So uh, 
today, as I'm going through my, my presentation, I want you to think about how you might be able to become a part of this effort, because it's not something that we can do alone by any means. Uh, because I, I have been accused of being an optimist, but I know that together we absolutely can make the promise of marine protected areas real. So to start, Ron, I actually have a video that introduces folks to the program. Shall I go ahead and roll with that? Yes, please. 50 years ago, we thought the ocean was indestructible. Today, we have lost half of the world's marine life. Thousands of miles of coastal ecosystems have been destroyed and climate change has triggered a vast die off of coral reefs. The ocean can recover, but we need to protect it now. Like National Parks, Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs, are one of the best conservation tools we have for our oceans. Properly enforced, they can address overfishing, habitat destruction, and loss of marine wildlife. They provide safe havens for endangered marine species, create jobs for coastal communities, and help restore fisheries that feed billions of people. Although more and more MPAs are being created, nearly 60% of them are not well protected, meaning they are little more than lines on a map or paper parks that lack the resources and capacity to provide real and lasting protection for marine wildlife. Wild Aid Marine is working to change that using our comprehensive blueprint for MPA success. For nearly 20 years, we've worked with local communities and governments to make the promise of MPAs real, building successful, well-protected marine areas. Wild Aid works with local partners, guiding them to the best solutions, including cutting edge technologies and providing comprehensive training. When we started in the Galapagos Marine Reserve in Ecuador, shark finning was rampant with up to 12,000 shark fins found in a single seizure. The rangers had one broken down vessel to patrol an area the size of New York State. Working with the Park Service, Wild Aid completed repairs, secured equipment, and provided training and infrastructure that have helped to make the reserve one of the best protected on the planet. Rangers now have a fleet of eight patrol vessels, a patrol plane, strategic bases and enforcement hotspots, AIS radar systems, and satellite vessel monitoring which can remotely follow all large vessels in and around the reserve. The Galapagos Marine Reserve is now a regional leader in effective marine protection, spearheading efforts throughout Latin America to prevent illegal fishing. And thanks to strong enforcement and decreased demand in Asia, they now have one of the densest shark populations in the world. Wild Aid Marine's experience in creating effective enforcement is unparalleled, and we are now working with partners all over the world to implement our model in mainland Ecuador, the Bahamas, Gabon, Tanzania, Indonesia, and Palau, creating regional centers of excellence globally. With your help, we can reach our ambitious goal of strengthening enforcement in 250 MPAs in the next five years. Together, we can deliver the protection our ocean needs. If you yeah, if you think about national parks of the oceans, think about the Galapagos. Many people often think about the Galapagos Islands as being islands, but there's actually a huge amount of ocean area surrounding that, right? Um, the amount of protections within each marine protected area can change. So in some places, almost no activity is allowed. In other areas, artisanal fishing, for example, might be allowed. But the bottom line is the goal of marine protected areas is to allow the wildlife and therefore the communities that depend upon it to thrive. So I'm gonna dive a, dive a little deeper here uh, into the content of that video. So first, uh, I've actually, I've had folks ask me, yeah, right, the oceans are in trouble, it's huge. You know, how much trouble could there actually be? Well, 100 million sharks each year are killed by humans, mostly for their fins. A quarter of the world's marine mammals are endangered. Sharks, or sorry, whales, dolphins, etc. as well, right? Six out of seven of the world's sea turtle species face extinction. And like, let's say 
you're not a big ocean person. You don't really, you don't really care about the turtles. Well, if you care about the people, 10% of the world's livelihoods, 10% of the people in the world, their livelihoods depend upon ocean fisheries and the health of our oceans. So this is not just a animal problem. It's a, it's a world problem. It's a people problem. Like I said before, marine protected areas are the best conservation tool we have to address this issue. How good? Well, in marine protected areas that are effectively implemented, you're going to see a tripling in the fish populations. And when there's more fish, there's more sharks, there's more cute sea lions, there's healthier oceans. So, so it's great. Why do we, why are we worried? Well, 60% of the world's marine protected areas, 60% are not, are not currently being well enforced. Add that to the fact that year over year over year, marine protected areas are being used as this tool where governments are declaring them, establishing these national parks, but then not actually protecting them. The goal is to ultimately really reach 30% of the world's oceans. But if, there's, if, you continue, if we continue on the current trend, that's just an extra 30% of the world's oceans that now have a target painted on them. And that's where we come in. So I talked a little bit about where the video mentioned our blueprint for MPA success. Here is the marine protection system. These five components that you can see on your screen right now, every single marine protected area in the world need them in order to have an effective marine protection system, an effective enforcement system. So surveillance and, surveillance and enforcement, that means you need to be able to find and catch the poachers, the illegal fishers. Uh, in some locations, that might mean a pair of binoculars in a very small coastal boat. In other locations, that could be mean advanced satellite systems and oceanic vessels. But no matter where, you gotta be able to find and catch them. Uh, similarly, you need to have policies and there needs to be consequences for the actions. So policies is just the laws. The laws need to actually apply and make sense within the area. And if a person breaks the law, there has to be a consequence for their action. Um, in the most serious of cases, that could be jail time. In the most minor, it could be a small fine, but there has to be consequences. Consistent funding. This whole system falls apart if you can't fund it in the long term, right? Now, where Wild Day comes in as enforcement experts is actually helping our partners on the ground to design a system that's pragmatic, right? They don't need the ocean's version of a Ferrari if a Honda Civic's gonna get the job done. Five, training and mentorship. My goal is to no longer be needed in the long term, right? I, I'm a sea kayak instructor on the side. That would be a whole lot of fun just to devote that <laughs> the rest of my time there. But if we're not mentoring the leaders of these marine protected areas, not just giving them the initial training, but giving that, them that long-term support so that they have someone that they can ask and um, call when they're facing a new challenge, then they're not gonna ultimately be independent. So that's another key, that's the, third, the fourth key component. And finally, community engagement. Your coastal community has got to on average, be your allies in protecting their resources, not, not your enemies. Because they're, there's more of them, they're smarter than you, and they're, all the money in the world is not gonna allow you to develop an enforcement system that works against a community that feels like they have been alienated um, or like they are not a respected partner in that system. 
So those are the five systems. Those are the five, those are the five components that every single marine protected area in the world needs. Okay. I'm gonna take, it, take you back to the Galapagos from where the video was, and I'm gonna put a little more of, a, uh, of an explicit face on what those, each of those components look like. So the Galapagos is an extremely advanced marine protected area in the developing world. I don't think I need to tell anyone here that it is a vibrant place. It's a World Heritage Site. And we talked a lot about the number of vessels and, and all the work there. I'm gonna bring you down to a little bit of the less sexy but super important components. So we're talking about surveillance and enforcement, making sure you can find and catch folks. Part of the challenge there is making sure that all the different agencies, all the different government groups that are responsible for this work actually can work seamlessly together. So we helped to support an MOU between the Navy and the Galapagos Park. So where before we had two sets of vessels operating independently of each other, now you've got Galapagos Park Rangers operating on naval vessels and Navy Marines operating on Galapagos vessels. You've got the Navy Marines who have the ability to arrest consistently engaging and supporting the park. Having someone that can actually conduct an arrest on your vessel gives you a whole lot more heft when you pull over an illegal fisherman than just wagging your finger at someone and taking down their name in a picture, right? On the turn side, the, the, the Navy, the Marines, they are extremely well-trained mariners, but, uh, and they're extremely, uh, and they are a naval force, but they have a lot less training at, um, in policing and in their fisheries regulations. So in recent years, when the Navy had to inter interdict several illegal Peruvian fishing vessels that were fishing in Ecuadorian waters outside the park, they took the park rangers with them to help advise them. Helps everyone, makes you much stronger, and also actually saves you money, which is important in the long run. Another example in the policies and consequences in gate area. Now, every single vessel that transits through the park is required to have some sort of transponder. Think, find my friend on your cell phone that is pinging, telling the park where they are. And it's either vessel monitoring system, which is, or VMS, usually for the fishing vessels, which is a formalized fisheries management tool, or automatic identification system, AIS, which is actually a boating safety anti-collision tool that is also able to be used um, to monitor the vessel's location. Uh, so it's pretty challenging in the park, right? So you can't be on a vessel in that park if you do not have permission to be in those waters. And it can be extremely challenging to comb through the hundreds of vessels that are allowed to operate in the park and pick out the few that aren't. Unless you start making it really easy to identify the vessels that are allowed there, which means the ones that aren't are much more apparent. Enter in a new set of laws, policies and consequences, requiring that Every vessel that doesn't already have some other find my friend type of transponder on board, it must carry the AIS. And they don't have to be, they don't have to be that fancy. What you're seeing in this picture are rechargeable like batons, basically. You bring out that that the artisanal fishing fleet was allowed to use. Bring it home, recharge it. When every time you get underway, put it, you know, put it up in the uh, in the bracket on your on your vessel and you're good to go. So these are simple and comparatively, another simple and comparatively low cost way to find, to find folks, making sure that you have the right set of policies and consequences in place. So here's an example of what AIS looks like uh, in real time. So in the upper left, you'll see a fishing vessel who's not authorized to be in the Galapagos. Slow down, set their fishing, their fishing gear, in this case, long line, pick it back up, and then continue to transit across the Galapagos Marine Reserve as it's going now. 
Now the uh, command center was monitoring this and notified the uh, Galapagos patrol vessel. So the patrol vessel was able to interdict the fishing vessel in time to bring it back to the, back to the islands. Knowledge is definitely power in this case. Let's go to the next, the next wedge there in the, in the marine protection system, consistent funding. Okay, the first thing I want you to, to look at is, here's, th here's three Galapagos patrol vessels. They're professional, they are well outfitted, but we're not talking huge overpowered vessels. You need to design the fleet and the system for what you need and for what you can afford to maintain. They do have some, some oceanic vessels in the Galapagos because there is some further off work, but when you have a partner like the Navy, that decreases the number of, of oceanic vessels you need. At the same time, we helped the park 20 years ago to design this fleet. But that means that those vessels are starting to uh, end their us usable service life, even with the maintenance. Uh, most of them were used when we first bought them 20 years ago. So uh, we've crafted a fleet renewal and investment strategy with them that demonstrates that in the long term, making those upfront purchases on new vessels is going to be saving millions of dollars in maintenance costs. Got to look at that funding stream. In cannot be less than what's going out. Training and mentorship and community engagement. Uh, the, when you're working with these rangers, uh, we've made sure that every single one has, had, has received basic training and advanced training for a few of them, and that they keep those skills up with renewed trainings over the time. Uh, but they actually have become mentors throughout the region. Just since I've started, started at Wild Aid, they have hosted uh, the Cocos Island, Costa Rica. They have hosted the Rapa Nui dele delegation, otherwise known as Easter Island in Chile. And now they're engaging in uh, discussions with uh, Chilean officials who are overseeing the development of the Patagonia MPA system that has MPAs larger than the size of uh, France. What we have invested in the Galapagos is expanding regionally. And that's what we want. I don't want to be necessary. <laughs> I, want, I want the Galapagos and the Latin Americans to be empowered to share, it, to share it on their own. And, and I will be the first to tell you that Galapagos is not perfect. No place is perfect in terms of their compliance, but it is having an impact, okay? Uh, those of you who are fellow ocean nerds will recognize the uh, creature in the left side of your screen as a sea cucumber, which is super important to the ecosystem, but also considered a delicacy in certain, in certain Asian countries. And they don't, they, they look like a slug. That's about as fast as they move. They're really easy to catch. So they're a very good indicator species for us on whether or not there's illegal activity happening. Well, you can, you, as you can imagine, seeing a year over year doubling of the sea cucumber population showed us some real impact. Even beyond that, the Galapagos has the densest shark population in the world. And after some additional training, the, the park had an 84% successful prosec prosecution rate in a year. So those consequences are, are being shown. As I had mentioned when we started, Galapagos isn't the only place in the world. Uh, though there is a movement to declare 30% of the world's oceans as marine protected areas. So, for us, our goal in the near term is to be reaching 250 MPAs by 2025. So I really look forward to your question, Ron. I encourage anyone else who might be listening, if you have any questions 
uh, feel free to reach out to us. Our website, um, and that's my and that's my email. Always happy to engage with folks who who want to help them move things forward. Great, Megan. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks for the briefing on what MPAs are. I've got some more questions for you. Please. So, um, how many MPAs are there in the world right now? There are about 15,000. Over how many countries? Most coastal countries have at least one, at least one MPA. Um, My research showed over 100 countries have MPAs. Does that make sense to you? That, does, that makes total sense, yep. Yeah. Give me an objective. How do you want to grow either enforcement of existing MPA agreements or the, the number of MPAs over time? Give me a milestone of mm -hmm. future growth. So growth of marine protected areas generally, not necessarily the number that Wild is engaged with. The best available science shows that at least 30% of the world's oceans need to be protected. Um, now it's not just within a country's waters. Uh, some of that's gonna have to come from the high seas, which is legally complex, but not unattainable. Um, and, you know, for wild aid, I'm not gonna be able to reach, I'm not gonna be growing to that level as an organization. I also don't think I need to. Um, I am, what I need to do and what I'm, I am doing is building those regional leaders like the Galapagos so that we can then be engaging in you know, and seeing that exponential engagement and support uh, worldwide. So, what percent of all the ocean areas now are covered by MPAs? Mm -hmm. It uh, it depends on how you define a marine protected area in terms of the degrees of protections. Uh, the sources will tell you that anywhere between five percent and 10% of the world's oceans are currently protected by MPAs. And when you said you want to grow that number to 30%, That's right. by what year? 2030. By 2030, so nine and a half years from now. The mission of Wild Aid, as I understand it, is to mm -hmm. uh, enhance existing MPA agreements and help the countries that have MPAs uh, get more benefit for the oceans by their existing agreements. That's now, right. Yeah, okay. that's right. And so you help them enforce MPA agreements and you teach them how to do a good job of it. So, yeah. so give, me a, give me a typical, like you, you showed the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how big is the MPA in the Galapagos? Galapagos mm -hmm. being part of Ecuador. Uh, right. Ecuador. Mm -hmm. How big is it? And then how many staff people do they have? And what's their annual budget to keep them, their MPA funded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's 133,000. So the Galapagos is going to be your most, is, is going to be on the upper end of what you're generally going to be seeing. Because it's an optimal it, MPA, if I understand. It is. Well, that and also um, most locations in the world aren't going to draw the kind of tourism that the Galapagos does, right? right. Um, so it's a um, 133,000 square kilometer ocean area, right? Um, and there are, uh, there are approximately 100 rangers between the land and the water, okay? So, because there, there are, it is an island chain where, where these, these folks operate. And their annual budget is $8 million. I can tell you that the Galapagos is in this unique situation where it, it funds itself because of that, because of the tourism that it does. In normal. Fines or fees? What's the revenue source of the MPA? Mostly fees. Yeah. I mean, like there are, they do, they do apply fines to, to, to parks, but the revenue is through tourism fees. Every single vessel that enters in, into, into it, um, every tourist that enters in all pay fees, which then supports the operation of the park. So, so, so a tour boat, wants to operate in the Galapagos and it's mm -hmm. got to pay money of different sorts for its own overhead and mm -hmm. part of its fee structure has to account for the fact that it pays a little bit of money to the Galapagos marine protected area. Exactly. Okay and so is that, is that a typical revenue model for MPAs? They charge fees to operate boats inside of the MPA? Yeah for those that are tourism based yes. Um, there are some MPAs 
that are more designed to help fisheries flourish. A fishery being, you know, a the, the pollock or you know what other, whatever whatever you might want to be capturing. What would you say the um, so there are other types of marine protected areas that are designed to allow there to be more fish for fishermen to catch, right? Uh -huh. um, and for those marine protected areas, the fee structure might more be based on fishing licenses to allow the marine protected area to maintain. So part of your fishing license fee goes to support and pay for the MPA that okay. keeps the environment fish healthy and enables the fishery to be more productive. Right, exactly. Um, and then there's emerging markets like blue carbon, right? I mean, there's there's a whole whole lot of carbon captured in mangroves um, that are that are well maintained. Um, so that's that's another that's another avenue that they can sometimes uh, that they're just starting to be able to tap uh, for resources. So explain that revenue source, blue carbon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So carbon marketplace, right? Basically, uh, folks, you know, some folks uh, need to need to emit pollution of some sort and they need to offset that pollution somehow usually by maintenance of forests is the um is the more traditional carbon fund well mangroves suck up per per acre a whole lot more carbon uh than than forests do so there is the an emerging market where the marine protected area would actually be paid um by the folks who need to or choose to emit carbon into the atmosphere, they pay the folks to maintain their mangroves to offset their carbon. So for instance, a polluter could mm -hmm. then pay an MPA to grow mangroves in the area to try to offset their carbon footprint. I got that right? You got it, yep. So give me the benefits uh, to tourism, potential benefits to tourism of an MPA. Let's say, and, and I'm beginning to get the picture that some MPAs are aimed at enhancing tourism and some are aimed at enhancing um, the fisheries. Is that the case? That's, that's the case, specialized, yes. Are there specialized uh, segments of MPAs? Are there types of MPAs? Some oriented toward fisheries, some to tourism, etc.? cetera? Yes. Um, it's a, you know, really a marine protected area is just what it sounds like. It's a, you know, area on the map that has greater protection than the area around it, right? Uh, so, so yeah, some of it, and you need to, when you design and establish that MPA, it needs to be designed in a way that it's gonna give you the outcomes that you're hoping for, right? So it can't be uh, excluding all fishing throughout a large area if the coastal community and government's goals include some ability for the coastal community to fish to fish legally and you know thrive off of that. How long have MPAs been around and where did they start? They really began to take off about a decade ago. Um, yeah. So um, you first hear what's the first one you heard of? Uh, the first one I heard of was in uh, Cabo Pomo in Mexico. Oh, it's a it's a smaller one on the a thousand thousand square kilometer kilometer area, which is thousand square kilometers. Yeah, which is plenty to have a great impact. It doesn't have to be a huge area for there to be great impact in the coastal community. So a thousand kilometers. So that could be ten kilometers by a hundred kilometers. That's a big yeah. big area. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, right. So now. Um, that we talked about MPAs that enhance fisheries. Mm -hmm. Do they do that by reducing the amount of catch in that area or how do they enhance fisheries? How yeah. do they enhance the richness of a fishery? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, usually through this effect called the spillover effect. So if you protect one area, hopefully it's prime nursery grounds, right? Like, uh, because there protect are areas- Protect means yeah. you can't fish? What is protect? Yeah, fish? that's right, you can't fish. Um, no other destructive practices, right? Like let's, a lot of times mangroves is where all the baby fish grow to be big fish. Um, and if you're protecting the mangroves, then you can't be tearing the mangroves up. They need to be in place, right? Um, and uh, as you're protecting, <laughs> protecting that area, you're gonna get more and more fish that are gonna be thriving. And there's gonna be an impact where these fish, either through their regular movements or there just gets to be so many of them that you're going to see more fish in the surrounding areas around the marine protected area. 
So in other words, while I began at the, in, earlier in this discussion thinking the way you're going to increase the fisheries is to not fish for a while, you're telling me there's other things you can do uh, to enhance the fishery besides reducing the amount of catch. And, and you're saying you can, you can plant and grow mangroves because that's a breeding ground or a, an area, incubation area for fish. Is that what you're describing? Yes? So that's, that is true that that's definitely a vital area. And yep. I think, yeah, I mean, there's, there's often a need for some decrease in catch, but okay. if you do it, if, if you manage it thoughtfully and have things like protecting, protecting key areas and fishing elsewhere, then you're not going to necessarily see um, as sharp of a decrease in how much fish can be caught. Um, up front. Tell me, tell me why I should reduce my catch and give me the argument why I'll get, I'll get something back later on that this reduction is a type of investment mm -hmm. in future fishery health. Yeah. Usually as I'm, you know, watching these conversations, it's all about um, do you want your children to be able to fish and do you want your, your children to be thriving uh, from a protein standpoint, usually a lot of coastal communities, that's all they have to eat. Um, and from that livelihood perspective, um, they usually a fisherman understands, right? The vast majority of them know that they're having to fish longer to catch less fish. And they understand that that's because that there's less fish in the ocean. Um, what can, the real challenging shift can be is convincing them to decrease their fishing because they might look at the guy next to, next to them and be like, yeah, well, what's this guy going to do? And this, that's, you know, a big part of where enforcement comes in. Now, there is a whole component of community relationships there where engaging all of those fishermen in, there's now this peer pressure where it's like, oh man, we all just signed this agreement. We all just raised our hand to an oath that said that we were going to be following these rules. Um, if I break the law, then what are they gonna think of me, right? Or we're all making the sacrifice together. Uh, but they also have to be confident that when, you know, Larry over there, who everyone knows is gonna get away with anything they can, tries to pull some funny stuff, there's actually gonna be consequences for his actions. So let's talk about the staff. If there's 100 people on the staff of the MPA for the Galapagos, yep. tell me what the, what's the staffing breakdown? How many people are doing what of that hundred people? Mm -hmm. So I don't know the exact I don't know the exact ratios, but I can tell you that you're going to need uh, it's going to it's going to sound really familiar to most folks that are in a business, right? You're going to need the folks who are on the water, on the ground, doing the job, educating the public, um, enforcing the laws, making sure that folks are are being able to operate safely. So you've got educational folks, you've got community relations folks, you've yep. got enforcement folks, yep. people who are keeping track with AIS of what's going on, sort of the IS, the IT department. Mm -hmm. You got scientists to make sure that what you're doing is actually having the impact that you want to be having. And they're, they're, they're doing biometrics on the ocean and measuring uh, the ocean acidification. What are they measuring? Uh, usually they're, they're uh, measuring the population, right? So, uh, Sampling a small subsample, okay, how many fish are in this area, and then using some equations to extrapolate from what you saw here to how many fish you think are here. Are they measuring the number of fish by catching fish or by somehow monitoring? How do they know how many fish there are in a particular MPA or an area it, within an MPA? It really depends. There is a growing um, number of options for figuring this out. Okay. Usually it's either catching fish and you track how long you've been get, how long you've been fishing and what kind of gear and how likely you are to catch a fish if it's in the area. Um, or it can be uh, visual, right? Like so for the sea cucumber fish populations, uh, they're not moving that fast. You can just, you know, they're not, not in that deep of water. You can just drop a scuba diver or a snorkeler on the side and they can they can count. So in, in in terms of the spirit of environmental stewardship, mm -hmm. um, 
where did environmentalism start? Was it did it start in America of watching out for the oceans? Where did where did the ocean stewardship start? And and how is it spreading? Is there increasing consciousness of this around the world, or is it um, not growing in popularity? Yeah. Um, so I would say that there has always been ocean stewardship, right? I, I mean, I'm here. Uh, every country that we go to that has a coastal community that had a long-standing tradition of ocean fishing had a long-standing tradition of how you managed your oceans and you respected your oceans in a way to make sure they're a fish for future populations. Um, we're all familiar with the stories now of how that's gone sideways because we would not be where we are today if that weren't the case. Um, but it's a I feel like conservation, it's a, it's a cultural norm, no matter where you go. Um, and you're talking about like, how do you talk to a fisherman? Like that's, that's usually it. You find, you know, there's, it's figuring out what, what that cultural norm is in that location. Um, so, back, so back to our example, the Galapagos, there's a hundred people that work for the MPA there. How many fishermen, how many commercial fishermen, how would you come up with a number for them? In the Galapagos, do you think? Yeah, so in the within the Galapagos, there are artisanal fishermen, right? So not we're not talking about these. Um, we're talking about vessels that are no more than like fifteen feet feet long, open open roads type. Okay. Type. Um, uh, and there are it's there are more fishing licenses that are active than they're active fishermen. It's in the low hundreds. How about that? In the low hundreds. Yeah. You're helping us understand what's the population of Galapagos? 30,000 people. 30,000 people and yeah. hundreds of fishermen. That is mm -hmm. commercial fishermen. Low hundreds. Yeah. Low yeah. hundreds. And then it's not counting the long lines guys with the big hundred foot boats. So those guys aren't even allowed into the pod. So okay. like there is no, there are no long line major commercial fishing vessels uh -huh. operating out of the Galapagos. Yeah. And what about big drag boats with big nets? They don't, they don't, they're not allowed to go in there. They're not allowed. Doesn't mean it never happens, but um, they're not, they're not allowed. Yeah. And there's no, it, it they're, they don't even, they're, they do not home port within the Galapagos. They would come from somewhere, either they would be like a high seas fleet that's operating for years without seeing land, or um, they're coming from some of the coastal countries in the Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean. And in your exemplar, in, in your video example, you mm -hmm. showed a, um, a fisherman coming in uh, from the uh, northwest, and then directly south of him, up comes a patrol boat and right. intercepts the fishing boat, and then brings the patrol boat back to port. Yep. Why did the patrol boat, I mean, why was the fisherman willing to come back to port? If he knows he did something wrong, why mm -hmm. didn't he skedaddle and head back to Southeast Asia? Well, that's where you get into your policing techniques, of, you know, where you board the vessel and require them to stop. Um, so I was, a, I was a law enforcement officer in the Coast Guard. So most of my engagement was on U.S fishing vessels, which um, could be a very different dynamic than in some of the countries that we engage in. But I have, I, I have worked in my wild aid hat in nine countries and counting now and, got, and, and accompanied them on patrols. And vast, 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 vast majority of these fishermen stop. Um, is the bottom even line. There's, the law, even even if, they're if they're breaking the law, um, I think there is a record. Well, in some cases, they're like, ah, well, you know, I'm not going to have any consequences anyway, so I might as well just like, you know, tell the guy, yep, 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 and then you know, go on my uh, my merry way. Um, and then, but then in like other other instances, it's just they they recognize the potential consequences for not stopping would be much bigger than. So let's talk about the consequences. That particular boat, it comes to port, mm -hmm. and, and does it pay a fine? What kind of fine would it pay? Give me a, give me a, a typical violation and how much it costs yeah. in the top of it. So these things need to be, um, like the penalty has to be consistent with the violation, right? Sure. Um, so 
we had in recent years, we've had both a Chinese transshipment vessel, which is basically like a cargo vessel that brings yeah. fish in from the active fishing vessel, um, cut through the marine reserve illegally and be interdicted. And How an Ecuadorian. How big a fishing ship is it? Uh, about 100 meters. 100 yeah, meters. Greater feet. Yeah. Um, and then similarly, an Ecuadorian, an Ecuadorian fishing vessel that actually had um, uh, donor vessels, so like small pongas operating with it, bringing the fish to the larger fishing vessel, yeah. um, operating again illegally within the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And in both of those instances, the vessel was seized, the master and crew were jailed. Um, the, the, on the case of the Chinese fishing, fishing vessel, it's now the, the new uh, cargo vessel that the Galapagos Islands used for inner island cargo transport, <laughs> like they're never getting that boat back, um, and fines in the millions, um, or in the hundreds of thousands to millions. So that's the good news story, right? Where it act, that is a degree of fine and consequence that absolutely will dissuade people from violating the law when they're the type of person where they're going to break the law unless the consequence is too great, right? Um, so in that case, their, their boat was actually confiscated. Yeah, is that? Yeah. yeah. Now, a smaller artisanal fishing vessel forgot to charge their AIS for the day, but otherwise is, um, is following the law. That would be a more along the lines of an administrative fine, like think like a speeding ticket that you receive. Um, 50 because, bucks, 80 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. More there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Enough, to, enough, to, enough to sting a bit, but not so much that you're putting a person out of business. Um, so now you've used the Galapagos as an exemplary MPA. Tell me about ones that are MPAs in name only. Where are these going to be in, in the, uh, parts of the, uh, Micronesia? Where would, where would you see MPAs that are being constantly abused? Um, so there is no region that is necessarily superior or inferior to others. We work in Micronesia, Eastern Pacific, West Africa and Central Africa, Western Indian Ocean, and we find varying states in all of those locations. Um, it's a global, global issue. So Somalia, uh, Somalia is noted for piracy off, yeah. the, off the east coast of Africa. So now, are there, is there an MPA there? There are MPAs in, in Somalia, yes. Um, I, and I have actually been invited to work there, but I, um, and, and some of my colleagues, fellow conservationists who work in the enforcement space do work there and I am, have nothing but respect for that. But I do. Really? Yeah. So they work at an MPA off of Somalia, off the coast of Somalia. Right. Yeah, there, there's it, usually they're at nonprofits that have a broader rule of law um, piece. Objective. So what would the what would the government of Somalia? How why would they be motivated to do something as law abiding and environmentally thoughtful as creating an MPA? Somalia is thought mm -hmm. to be kind of a, a failed state outlaw country. Mm -hmm. What were the motivations to create an MPA in a lawless air environment like that? So I can't speak in too much detail because I, I just don't know it, but I can tell you that everywhere in the world, people need to eat. Everywhere in the world, people are able to recognize that being good stewards of their marine resources gives them more to eat, gives them maybe someday access to tourism revenue, right? Like all of the benefits that, that that can give you. They recognize that. And a lot of times it's just empowering them with the understanding of how to do so. Yeah. Now you've been very uh, diplomatic and not defining areas that have low enforcement of MPA regulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what about the United States? Do hmm. we have lots of MPAs? How many do we have? Are yeah. they more on the east and the west or more on the west and the east coast? Where are they? Yeah, yeah. So we have, uh, we, we have MPAs nationwide in the United States. Um, 
I don't know the raw number now. I can I can get that. Ballpark. I can get that to you. Ballpark, like twenty some odd. Um, but they're they're big. They're, some of them are big, right? Like we've got the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which when it was established was the largest MPA in the world. Um, Didn't you so, say fifteen thousand MPAs? In yes, in the world. But mm -hmm. and if there's fifteen thousand in the world, yeah. Four percent of the population. Yeah. Um, how many MPAs in America? Yeah. Well, I think I think uh, when we're talking about numbers, uh, the total number of MPAs doesn't. You know, like we could have the United States could have five thousand one square kilometer MPAs, and that and they'd be too small to have any real impact, right? Okay. Um, so you, in general, when we're looking uh, nationwide or worldwide at the quality of MPAs or when you're driving a nation to increase the protection of their waters, you're looking at the percentage, right? So you're encouraging each nation to protect 30% of their waters. Oh, that's um, a guideline. Wait, wait, let me hear that guideline again. You, 30%, yeah, 30% is the guideline. <laughs> so you guys at Wild Aid propose mm -hmm. as a best practice that countries uh, try to put 30% of their coastline, of their ocean, mm -hmm. uh, of the area of their ocean? I'd say that's a global best, pra that's a global standard and best practice that the conservation community has adopted in general. Um, I, we, we support governments, right? Like I cannot build up an effective enforcement system if I'm not supporting a government entity. So we tend to act less as a advocacy organization that is pushing at least publicly a government to increase to make actions and more as a part as a enabler to help them to do what they need to do to increase their protections does that make sense like there's a lot of like um there are many ngos few charitable trusts uh national geographic christine sees I'm not, I'm gonna, I'll miss a lot that work in the uh, establishing the MPA space. Mm -hmm. In general, we're, we're supporting when the MPAs are actually established. So now Wild Aid is a 501c3. Mm -hmm. Founded? What's that? When was, when was Wild Aid founded? Uh, we were founded about, about 25 years ago. And it's a 501c3. Yep. And and your total staff of people is in, in, in Wild Aid? We're, we're 60 worldwide. Six zero. Yes. 60 people worldwide. Yep. And, and you operate in how many countries? Uh, right, right now we're operating in 10, in 10 countries and I'm supporting 40 marine protected areas. 40 marine protected areas. Yep. Your annual budget, Wild Aid's annual budget is? About 10 million. And so now, how, who funds MPAs around the world? Where is, uh, you said they're somewhat self-funding, mm -hmm. but when it comes to money that goes into a 501c3 from donors, uh, who are the donors and or organizations that are big in funding uh, MPAs? Private individuals, institutions, who? Thankfully, it has a wide appeal. Uh, private individuals, absolutely. Sometimes folks who hop in the water on a dive trip somewhere and is really passionate about protecting it. Uh, and, you know, larger philanthropists that have greater means that care about the oceans and recognize the need. In addition, uh, USAID, World Bank, right? Um, for all those reasons of uh, security and livelihoods, you need, if you care about those things, they recognize that you care about marine protected areas. So they also provide um, provide funding and uh, more traditional uh, foundations also. also yeah. give, me, give, me, give me your fundraising sort of like um, uh, budget. What percent do you get institutional? What percent from private individuals? Yeah, so I am at like 50, like 40, 60, 50, 50 year to year between the two. It's a pretty, it's a pretty even split for me. 40, 60, who's the 40 and who's the 60? Oh, 40 would be insti institutional and 60 would be individuals. Um, yeah, yeah. And so what's the average size of a donation? Uh, we, we get, oh, I mean, like average is a little, we get everything from 
$10 donations to uh, from private individuals, you know, $250,000 a year donations, right? So you get the full, you get the full range. So somebody who listens to this and says, yes, mm -hmm. I want to help, you know, maintain healthy oceans and make more of the ocean healthy, they would send money to wildaid.org? That's right. Okay. Yep, we got that. Yeah, and just call you to get involved in an uh, annual giving program or something like that. What about your job, a day in the life? Mm -hmm. What percent of your total yeah. annual, uh, hours, your 2,080 hours a year, you spent fundraising, mm -hmm. what percent you spent administratively, do you spend any time in enforcement? Give me the buckets of activities that yeah. you, you manage your marine areas. What does what your job entail? Yeah, like at this point, in the position I'm in, half my time program, is the marine program director. The marine program director, half my time is fundraising. Half. Um, yeah, and then the rest, I am lucky to have a fantastic administrative support team. So, uh, ten to twenty percent of it is, you know, administrative leadership. You know, making sure my folks are in the right place, and the rest of it is more strategic or being on the ground in countries or working with my team. Uh, who are the subject matter experts in law enforcement and making sure they're they're guiding all our partners in the same way. So, so how many volunteers are there, people who don't get paid, but who support Wild Aid, Wild Aid with volunteer efforts? How many volunteers are connected to Wild Aid? Yeah, so we have uh, a handful of volunteers actually within the staff um, that have just have fantastic skills and give us time. That's anything from uh, translation services to, um, we have one amazing woman who which does an amazing amount of work in helping us to pull off our annual gala um, and things along those lines. Uh, and then otherwise there's, you know, there's always videographers that, that you know, volunteer time or resources. Videographers? Oh, people who take videos? Yeah. <laughs> um, or photographers. Oh, video, videographers. videographers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if a volunteer um, wants to help you, give me the opportunities, what they can do. They can do a, they can be a videographer. They can, what else can they do? Yeah, no. So I think uh, for, for our end, whenever yeah. we do any community, community engagement work, um, it is also, it is always really helpful for us to have extra hands um, to, help make the event happen and, and go smoothly. Um, there is also uh, in, any, in the same thing, any of, our, any of our events, it's always helpful to have an extra set of hands. Um, folks who are, have translating ability is always really helpful or, or bi bilingual, multilingual is always really helpful for us. And then honestly, um, if you have connections and know of people who could benefit from us or, um, partners that we should talk to. We don't do this alone, right? I don't, I don't create the satellites. I don't create the satellite tech. I don't, um, we're building a smartphone app and uh, like, wow, am I learning a lot <laughs> about that. Um, uh, you know, if you know of folks who have those kind of skills or who might be able to contribute, then connecting them to us is, is hugely helpful because it's got to be a team effort. <laughs> now, you guys facilitate and enhance and help and try to optimize MPAs. How many other 501c3s are there like Wild Aid in the world? Very few. Um, for, you know, for understandable reasons, not a lot of NGOs get into the enforcement space, the law enforcement space. Um, I'm not, we're not conducting law enforcement operations, but we're, we are advising on it. And that's just a unique, a unique skill. And you bring that down to marine resource enforcement. Um, there's us and, you know, a handful others that have that, that have that skill. Um, there are a growing number of NGOs, thankfully, that bring tools, technology, like the satellite-based fisheries monitoring into it. Um, so it's growing, but the nitty gritty on the ground, you know, I, I was a law enforcement officer in the Coast Guard and my team of folks are similar um, in experience where they've been marine resource enforcement, fish and game wardens, etc. cetera. Um, bringing, having those people who just get on the ground and 
talk with the rangers and go on patrol with them and help build and design that system. There's just not many of us. No. So I, you're saying like less than a dozen? Oh, I'm saying less than three. Like, like wild. Like, like as in there's, there's, yeah, like there's, um, wildlife conservation society does some work in specific locations around the world okay. regardless but it's not their broader skill set it's more location based if it's a marine for marine focused i'm really almost it um, well, um like the biggest one you're saying we are we are yeah oh, great. <laughs> well, listen, uh, i'm so glad somebody's taking care of the ocean many of us uh feel uh, happy to give you airtime and a little bit, in my case, guilty that I spend so much time racing sailboats and, and in the ocean and in the bays that I want to do everything I can to kind of facilitate a healthy, you know, aqua environment. By the way, I didn't ask this. Are MPAs only saltwater? Are there freshwater MPAs too? Yeah, absolutely. What percent of all the MPAs are freshwater? What percent of all the MPAs are saltwater? So when I'm talking about marine protected areas, they are all salt water, but there are, um, there are protected areas um, that are in, within wetlands or within you know, the, larger, the larger lakes of the world. So, um, but when I'm talking about marine protected areas, I'm only talking about what's on the ocean. Okay, MBAs really just refers to ocean, not lakes, not big lakes and so on. No. Megan Brosnan, uh, we need someone with 007 skills to keep the pirates off our off our uh, off our oceans and to patrol them. And we're very happy at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon to know that somebody out there uh, has gone from being a Coast Guard enforcement person to being a fully conscious environmentalist of the sea. Really, I don't mean to be flowery about what you're doing, but we're happy that you're out there uh, wanting to improve tourism in the oceans and improve the healthiness of our oceans. Globally, who are the types of organizations that are in favor of MPAs and what are the types of organizations that are against MPAs? And I mean global types, like yeah. fishing industry, that would be one. Are yeah. they generally in favor of or generally not in favor of MPAs? World yeah, world. and yeah, and that again, that really depends because um, there are is a very healthy population of the fishing industry that recognizes that um, protecting portions of the world will only help the fishing in the future. Um, and then there's portions of the fishing industry, um, especially as you get extremely corporate, that don't really have that long-term vision. Um, and then, and otherwise, yeah, I mean, the more, uh, there's always, diamonds in the rough, but marine protected areas generally remove extractive industries from the space, from the space. Extractive industries, oil and gas exploration. Yeah, and deep, those deep sea mining. What? Deep sea mining, which is emerging. Yeah, exactly. Deep sea mining, those people on the other side of the, of the teeter tottering from you. You don't want those people, and they're basically against you creating MPAs. And what about developers? Uh, it really depends on how, what their model is. If the developer's model is to have a more exclusive or inclusive design, i.e. you only have a few people on the coast and they're very high value, and or they recognize that they have obligations to the coastal community that they may or may not be displacing to maintain it, then they're, they're all for it because it's a very effective avenue if their focus is going to be on cramming as many people as possible in an area. Um, might still want a marine protected area because uh, you want there to be fish for those people to see. But uh, having too many people in an area still makes it really challenging. <laughs> so now I'm talking to you from the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Farallon Islands is off the coast of, of San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Is that an MPA out there on the Farallons? Where are the closest MPAs to the Bay Area? Yeah, the, uh, so there's a whole uh, network of coastal marine protected areas in the Bay, throughout the Bay Area. So Farallons, yes, absolutely. Um, I believe it's actually a national marine sanctuary. 
um, which has added protections. Um, but um, if you look at the NOAA MPA Center, they have, um, or, or if you even just Google California Marine Protected Areas, you, you almost certainly have one in your backyard that has educational opportunities and really gives you a chance to get your feet wet. <laughs> so when you say NOAA, so there's a section on the NOAA website called MPAs in it, and it, and it delineates where MPAs are in, the, in yeah. California? So if you, if you look up NOAA MPA Center, there's actually a center of excellence in, in the management of marine protected areas and included within that includes information about the United States MPAs. What is the payback on an MPA? Is it good, you know, does it take 50 years to get an MPA cost to pay back or is it free mm -hmm. to pay back? Mm -hmm. it, uh, it depends on how bad the, the situation is, is to start from, uh, but generally you'll see, you will almost always see huge benefits within a decade, but in many within three years. Um, there are also um, organizations that focus on like short-lived species like octopus, where even uh, closures of a matter of months will, will have huge dividends and benefits to the coastal community. Great. Well, Megan Brosnan, we're very happy that you're um, keeping an eye out in the oceans. We wished Wild Aid um, all the success possible. And uh, thank you very much for sharing your story with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks so much for the time. I appreciate it. <laughs> with that, our luncheon is adjourned. Thanks so much. <laughs>